Oh, okay, that's better then. Yeah, let's use that one. Oh, yeah, but you have to do function. Um, yeah, you don't run one.
Okay. Well, so let's get started then. Um. Welcome everybody to the Project Atomic BOF. Um, this actually is intended to be a BOF. So we, rather than having one single presentation, we're going to have a whole series of things and later on there will be t-shirts and pizza. So hopefully pizza it was supposed to be here by now, so we'll see. The, um, yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to be covering basically the, the whole range of projects under Project Atomic. Obviously going to be talking about Atomic Host, um, including both Fedora and CentOS Atomic Host. Uh, and, but then talking about all of the other, talking about se a selection of the other projects like um, KPOD and RPM OS Tree and the Atomic CLI and Scopio. Um, and other things. Hmm? Right, oh, okay. Wow, you, you, we, it's not my fault you keep, you change names faster than I can change my uh, swag. Yeah. Um, so here's the lineup uh, everybody can see today. Um, yep, and we will have time for questions and discussion. Um, the, um, I, for anybody who wasn't already aware, uh, the way to find all this stuff later is projectatomic.io, uh, our website, um, where we have links to all of the various projects um, and their information. Um, the, um, uh, that website, by the way, has finally been moved to OpenShift v3. Um, we were actually running it on OpenShift v2 um, up until last fall, um, mostly because of server availability. Um, if you're wondering where ask.projectatomic.io went, it's, we decided to terminate it um, and direct people to server fault instead. Um, so if you want you know, web-based troubleshooting, go over to server fault, which is where people will look for questions. Obviously, if you can use email or IRC, um, that's better. You're going to get a more interactive response. Um, so the other big thing that's happened recently is... Um, I've moved on to working on something else at Red Hat, and we have hired a terrific new Project Atomic community manager um, who uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more from, and that's Sonia. Hi. Thanks for saying terrific and not terrible. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to change the website a bit uh, in the next months and probably in February. There's going to be new docs, so don't be too confused now if something's not clear. Um, I wanted to, can, you, can we make a show of hands about who's using RSC now? Just in general, not the Atomic Channel. Okay, so everyone. So you'd be fine with joining the Atomic Channel, for example. I was just wondering if we, if we should move to another channel, but obviously everyone's fine with IRC. Um, so there's going to be a lot of website changes. Um, we're also going to introduce Atomic Workstation a little more. And we have free talks about it just to, tomorrow, actually. Um, yeah, so I think we'll just move on. Um, and a lot of questions. And Dusty is very active in the Atomic channel and a lot of other people. So if you have any questions, the RC channel is the place to go. Let's move on. Are you? Where is it? OK, here it is. So we're starting with Cockpit UI. <laughs> don't trip, don't trip. Hello, everyone. So, uh, does everyone, uh, does anyone not know what cockpit is? So, should I give a quick intro? I don't know what cockpit is. You don't know what cockpit <laughs> is. Well, okay. So, basically, <laughs> well, uh, cockpit is the face of a server. So, cockpit is a, a web UI for interacting with your server. So, you can administer your Docker containers, your virtual machines, you can set up complicated storage devices, check and apply your software updates, inspect logs, look at performance monitoring, and so on, and lots more. And like what sets it apart to projects like Webman or Ansible, for example, is that these projects, they basically take in a, a predefined state and impose and apply that onto your server. And from then on, they basically own the server. This is useful in a lot of cases, 
But in other cases, you don't really want to own a server that way, but you want to interactively drill down to some node there. Why is it misbehaving? What's going wrong? Or you just might want to install a complicated LVM on VDO, on Lux, whatnot storage setup, like stuff that you do once a month or less. So it needs to be easy and discoverable instead of efficient, where web UI makes sense. So cockpit, it doesn't have any cockpit specific state or configuration on the system. So it just interacts with the normal APIs that you would also use on the command line or in a program like GNOME Disks, for example. So Cockpit uses DBus to talk to UDisks, for example, or it calls pvcreate to uh, configure your LVM, or it uh, can talk to, to REST uh, sockets for Docker or Kubernetes, for example. And uh, yeah, is that the one? Oh, okay. So on, on, uh, on Atomic itself, so, uh, the, the, the normal Atomic images, they are much like a server, so they don't have a graphical user interface. So uh, it makes very a lot of sense to use Cockpit on those. By default, there is not a lot of Cockpit-ish stuff uh, pre-installed into the OS tree. So what we see here is a Cockpit Bridge, which is basically the moral equivalent of bin bash for Cockpit. So this is just the thing that translates JSON into, let's say, a dbus call or a command line call or a REST call. And then some of the cockpit pages that you use to, like, uh, the, basically the modules that you want to use on Atomic. But there is no cockpit web server or anything else. So it's very little footprint by default, very little wasted space, and there's nothing running at all. So, and of course, in the usual manner, we... We support cockpits, like the web server, not only as an RPM package, but we also uh, regularly release a container for that. So you can install it in the usual manner there, and then it will run as a container, and will still give you access to administer your atomic host. <coughs> so, and after you do that, you can log in normally, and you will see the normal cockpit screen. We will see all the available modules there. So I don't want to go into the details so much, but for example, you can look at which containers are running. So you can see that um, uh, Cockpit's own container is running there. That's the Cockpit WS. And they also have like a little busy box thing just to illustrate. <coughs> so this is how you would uh, use Cockpit to man manage, uh, how you would get Cockpit running on Atomic. But you can also uh, use Cockpit to manage your Atomic host itself. Most notably, to check for and install software updates. On a classic system, you would get like the normal package list there and use YAM or GNF. But in Atomic, of course, we use OS tree. So you see, we are currently running 7.4.2. But there is a new OS tree, or let's say an Atomic release available, 7.4.3. And you can actually drill down into the the available packages there. So there is no change logs for the visual packages because we don't have that metadata, but you can at least get a, a grasp of what changed. And <laughs> you can click on update and reboot, and then you see it's doing the receiving things. So it's downloading the update and reboots your machine. You can reconnect and voila, we have the new system running. If anything is not working as intended and the new version breaks something, then you can use the roll back and reboot button and you'll go back to that. And as I said, it's just using the normal OS interfaces, so you can also, ooh, that didn't get out nicely, but maybe you can read it. So you can also use the normal shell commands like sudo rpm os3 status, and you basically see the exact same information in text format. And that's it really, so over to Colin. All right, cool, thanks. That was a good segue, actually. So um, the way I like to think of the analogy I'm going to use, actually, in a talk later tomorrow is I think of the host systems a little bit like peanut butter, and containers are like jelly. They're things that go together. But if you look at the whole ecosystem, a lot of people actually have very distinct host upgrade systems from application mechanisms. Like, so a good example is on Android, the way the host update works is totally different from the way APKs work. It's just they have no relation at all. And uh, there's some reasons for this. Um, anyway, so Austria actually started before Docker. Um, and uh, so just really briefly, the way to think of OS3 is just a way to get um, files from A to B. It does atomic upgrades, just like you know, on Android now, the modern one. 
you have an A-B style thing. Oster is actually a lot more flexible than that, but it's totally agnostic to what you put into it. Um, and yeah, again, if you're interested in that, uh, there's going to be more in my talk. Um, RPM Oster, though, is a hybrid image package system. So we've closely integrated OS3 as an image system with RPM. So one of the interesting things here is, you know, in, in Cockpit, the OS has a version number, as is proper, right? But you can drill down and look at the packages, right? So we've sort of committed actually to only putting RPMs in here, and this is, this is where things get deep, right? Is because otherwise, otherwise things would be too messy. So um, yeah, so you can, go, you can go back and forth. So the, the advantages of the, and, and actually to back up a little bit, what I like to tell people is, if you're curious about Project Atomic, jump into containerizing first, and then do, um, do an atomic uh, host or, or workstation uh, after you've gotten some familiarity with containerization. Uh, so yeah, we're actually, RPM industry, we, I, as far as I know, no one's doing anything like it. There just, there are no other hybrid image package systems out there. Um, it'll be interesting to see if anyone invents another one later. Uh, and yeah, so, the example I'll use in my talk is I actually have libvert layered on my home server, and you know on my workstation uh, there's just some various things that, yeah, just hard to containerize. So uh, yeah, that's pretty critical. So the status of the projects, um, one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about is I feel like we've just built a powerful base, and we're actually accelerating and building on it, um, gaining features. So we release upstream approximately monthly. We're very stable. So 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 far we haven't to my knowledge, really ever broken anything uh, critical. And of course, if we did, you can always roll back. And uh, yeah, if we did regress something, uh, yeah, you can roll back, report the bug. And if it's important enough, I will revert it upstream and we'll, we'll go back and, and fix it again. So a classic example is we may not be compatible with all RPMs, so, but I, I you know, and I, will break compatibility with some RPMs in order to implement atomic upgrades. That's not negotiable, but you know, if, we, if we broke something, yeah, let us know. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it's a totally different track uh, so from containerization, but it's good. It's, and there are multiple talks around the atomic workstation stuff, so if you're interested in that, go to those. But um, it is really nice for pet systems, so especially yeah, I mean, this desktop runs Atomic Workstation. I just love the fact that I have Atomic upgrades, right? Like, I've, it's just, yeah. Because actually, I, I, use, I use Nouveau with an external monitor, and like, it just locks up the kernel sometimes. And I just update in the background without fear, right? Because it just doesn't matter if my kernel freezes because the upgrades are Atomic. Uh, and yeah, so this is, not this is not covered in my talk, but um, we're going to make a huge, one of the probably, if this succeeds, it'll be one of the biggest changes in the history of the RPM OS3 project. We, I'm going to try and de-emphasize OS3 a little bit. Like right now, it's very, like if you look at Cockpit, it's very, there's a lot of OS3 stuff there. There's the checksum, there's the branch name. Um, we're going to make it a little bit more like a package, like a meta package. And actually, the OS3 image will come as an extra RPM, and we'll reuse the RPMs from the base. So, so it'll be less OS tree on the wire. You'll be able to mirror it more easily. Um, and if you're doing custom composes, now it's easier to, especially for Fedora release engineering, now they only have to manage RPMs and Docker slash OCI. Right? They don't have to think about how do we mirror, uh, promote uh, OS tree repos. So it's tricky because this sort of takes us away from the embedded space. Like there are a lot of OS tree users who don't use RPM in the embedded space. And uh, they really like the OS3 deltas. So we're going to do both, and it'll be interesting. Uh, that's ongoing, but uh, we're pretty close to landing it. And that's about it. So this is Scopio. How many of you know Scopio? I'm famous. It's famous. So <laughs> a little bit of history about Scopio. So about two years ago, or three years ago maybe, uh, we wanted to be able to inspect the images on Docker registers, and we asked Docker Upstream to provide a command to do that, but they didn't want to do that. So we actually started this tool called Scopio, uh, and the first thing it did was to go uh, online to a 
registry and just grab j the JSON file associated with an image. Uh, and that was enough for what we wanted to do at that time. But later, went further and we added commands like pulling and pushing images because we actually needed those for some other project like Atomic. Um, and right now, uh, Scopio does have an ND, a super ND command, which is a uh, copy where you're able to take uh, some source image and copy it to a destination and you can go back and forth between source and destination because we actually support many transports like the Docker registries, OCI images, the Docker daemon itself and stuff and many other uh, transport you can, you can think of actually right now, uh, like the Docker tarball as well. Um, so at some point uh, we actually uh, extracted the core of Scopio into something uh, which we called containers image. And so uh, now there is a library, uh, a containers image, which you can actually import in your own project and do whatever Scopio is actually doing in your, I mean, in your, in your tools and whatever. Uh, and so, for instance, we, we added containers images to many other tools like Cryo, Builda, Podman, uh, and, doc and our Docker itself. Um, and yeah, also containers images is uh, used by many other projects outside Red Hat as well, like Container Diff, uh, which is a Google project, and Cloud Foundry is also uh, using it. Uh, Scopia is pretty stable at this point; it's going for two years, so you can actually use it uh, in scenarios like you have a build pipeline and you want to actually build your images somewhere and push it to a container registry, you can actually use Scopio to sync images between a source and a destination state. Uh, it's still under active development, and one thing it does have, and we're still working on, is uh, simple signing, which I talked about yesterday. So with Scopio, you're actually able to uh, sign images on push and verify signature for images on pull. Um, and I guess that's it. I don't know if, yeah, that's it. Okay, how many people just saw my talk before this? Okay, so you, you about half of you know what uh, Podman is. Podman's probably the, might be the newest uh, package up on Project Atomic. Um, do you think? I don't know. Uh, but been, it's been there for a while. It, there is no packages available for Podman, although they should be available in Fedora very soon. Um, the, the, it, we talked about uh, the, the origins of Podman was basically to uh, give us a command line tool that would mimic what the Docker CLI does. Um, so that was the original goal, um, and mainly for debugging uh, problems that are happening underneath Cryo. Um, but we've actually looked to it. We're looking to expand it. Uh, we also, um, we, we actually, it's under the, the LivePod uh, repository. The reason we did that is we actually are experimenting with LivePod. So for those that don't know, pods is a Kubernetes concept where you have one or more containers sort of joined together and you treat that as an entity as opposed to just a single container. Um, pods are very useful for things, I call them sidecar containers. So you might have a, a container running um, on a system and then you have another container inside of the same basic environment that's monitoring the primary container. Um, sometimes you might want to have a container that's more privileged. So say you had, uh, the case I always talk about is like NVIDIA cards. Sometimes you might want to have a container that takes advantage of NVIDIA, uh, but you don't want to allow it to have, uh, say, sysadmin root privileges on the system. You might want to have the, the initial container come down as privileged, load a kernel module to make the NVIDIA, light up the NVIDIA card, and then you'd write, run your software in a more lockdown. So there's, there's, there's all sorts of interesting concepts uh, of pods. So what we want to do with live pod is basically experiment with those. One of, one of the questions I've been asked, and I'm not sure how we answer this right now, is if I'm running a pod with, say, two or three containers running in it, what's, you know, how do I define what happens when one of the containers dies? Does the entire pod die at that point? Does, you know, we automatically restart the 
the, the, the container that died, um, or do we just allow that container to die and the thing to continue? So the, those types of states you have to think about as you, as you move to pods. Um, so right now, Podman mimics the Docker CLI, but what we want to do is actually add, um, because we have pods built into this con into the live pod, we want to be able to start doing things with pods. So you'll be able to do a Podman pod and list out the pods on the system. You might be able to you'll be able to do a Podman run container dash dash pod and it'll stick your container into an existing pod, list the containers in the pod. So there'll be all sorts of CLI interaction. Um, and unlike Docker, this will all happen without a daemon running. So this is just just interaction. You'll be able to take Podman very easily and run it in the system unit file. So if you want to just run a container on your host uh, without building up a big infrastructure or having a big fat daemon running on your system, then Podman might be an interesting case. So as I said, Podman hopefully within the next week will become a package in Fedora. We're going through the Fedora review process at this point um, and it eventually making its way into RHEL. Hi, I'm Nalan. Uh, so Nalan um, was supposed to make it and got uh, frozen uh, out in Boston, so his plane never could take off. So he uh, decided not to come. Um, so Builder is a uh, is a basically uh, what I like to call is core utility uh, uh, container images core utility. So the, the idea here is to build a tool, a very simple tool to build. Uh, containers image, uh, containers images. Um, it takes advantage of uh, basically the, sco the underpinnings of Scopio and containers image. Um, takes advantage of another project called container storage, and it basically allows you to build containers images on the host using standard Bash scripts, scripting tools. It also supports Docker file, and allows you to you know move a container image, push it up to a container registry, um, pull it down. Um, it actually shares all of the infrastructure with Podman, Cryo, Scopio, so they all can interact. They all have the same storage on the system. And um, Podman's uh, right now is available in Fedora, Ubuntu, um, uh, RHEL. Um, it's uh, supported in, in RHEL at this point. We wa we're looking to get it um, as the underpinnings of additional tools like OpenShift. Uh, also, we're looking to work with Ansible containers. We're looking to uh, and there's a lot of people looking at Builder. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Most of the people that are looking at Builder right now are really sort of focused at running builds inside of sort of a distributed architecture. So they're, they're interested in, um, say, using Kubernetes to farm out lots, of, lots and lots of builds and, and using Builder. And so the current way of doing that is actually to leak, leak the Docker socket into the container. So a lot of people are looking at that. Next generation builder, our goal with it is to actually get us to build containers without requiring privilege. So right now, we still require privilege to do it. The main reason we require it is we need the ability to mount. It's a difficult thing to do without privilege. Even if you ran it inside a user namespace, user namespaces don't allow you to do real mounts. Okay, The only thing you can mount inside of a user namespace is temp fs's and bind mounts. So we're, we're experimenting with that. We might be looking at different types of file systems. Other people have done some builders that they claim that they can do it, but the real goal of builder is, uh, so people that have, have built other types of builders, they're not taking advantage of RPM content. So my, in order to get builder to run as non-root, I still want to be able to support RPM. So I don't want people saying, okay, well, if you do a make install, it'll work, sort of, and you know that type of stuff. But uh, anyways, that's that's Builder. Hold on, I might be going back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm Giuseppe Scrivano. Uh, uh, Giuseppe's upstairs. If you're interested in this, you should run upstairs right now. Yeah, it was horrible timing on this. Um, <laughs> I want to be upstairs seeing Giuseppe right now, but. <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm two of you, that's the problem. Um, so Atomic is, is an interesting tool, and, and potentially we shouldn't have called it Atomic um, just because it confuses everybody, and I get bugs all the time in Atomic for people that are using the Atomic 
workstation or atomic uh, uh, platform, um, and I'm constantly rerouting them. Um, so the atomic command, uh, the real goal with atomic command originally was to sort of add features that we thought were necessary for uh, running Docker containers. And over time, we've actually extended it. So Atomic now wraps other types of tools. But uh, one, of the things, one of the things we wanted to experiment when we originally did Atomic was um, when you install a container image on a host, um, the uh, you know, how do you do that, right? And when I install a container image on a host, it usually means that I get the image from someplace and then someplace else. Problem with that in that, um, you know, I am I'm the person, the engineer that's building the container image. I should be able to build everything into the container image. It's sort of like if the way you install RPMs is you, you pull down an RPM, and then you would have to go and get the post install script. Uh, I guess that's the analogy I, I'd like to say is that you know, there's two separate processes. You go to a website and you go to a container registry. That's how you install software. Uh, so what we wanted to do is embed the intelligence into the container image that said how to install it or how to run it or how to, to interact with it. Um, so uh, that was the original goal with Atomic. And Atomic's actually grown lots and lots of features. There's really a lot, ton of uh, really nice features of it. But we actually took Atomic to another, another level in that we came up with this idea of what we call system containers. So most people think of containers as being something that runs underneath Docker, big fat container daemon. Um, but a container really is just an image that sits out of the registry. And really what I want to do is I just want to pull that image to my host and then run software in it. Yeah, oh. you said the exact same thing as we were going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Giuseppe. <laughs> So you, you basically wanted to, to be able to pull an image to the host and install it on the host, and then you want to run software on it. So here, in this case, she's showing it, uh, this demo shows how you could pull an image to the host and then run it and, and install the software. A misconception that often comes up when I talk, well, people talk about this, at least it's a misconception. <laughs> I think this misconception is that system containers means that you have to run a container. So, a definition of a container, I like to define a container, everything on a Linux system is a container, right? Just, they're just processes. So if I, the main thing here is I want to get my software installed on the box and then run processes inside of that. If I'm running software inside of that and that's just a cheroot, that's fine. If I want to use system D to um, configure and do other stuff inside, that's fine. If I want to use run C to do stuff on top of it, that's fine. Um, but the main, main goal here is that I just got that software from a container registry, pulled it to the host, and started running software. So with system containers, and I, I, I sort of hinted at it, one of the things you can do with a system container is you can embed intelligence about how system D would run it. So a lot of system containers, the main, the, the, the main system D, uh, the main con uh, system containers that exist right now um, tend to be written for running um, the OpenShift work stack. So if I run OpenShift, I need to have a container runtime running, I need to have a network daemon running, and I need to have a database that Kubernetes uses running. Kubernetes, that's called etcd. So what we wanted to do is, you know, so if you think about it, if I want to run all those things inside of containers, um, you know, the container runtime is one of the things I want to run inside a container, so how do I bootstrap that? So with system containers, we have the ability to bootstrap those four system containers. In my wild visions of the future, I'd like to get to the point where anything could be run instead of, you know, always have forcing you to run, um, you know, RPM installs or, uh, this is when Colin usually gives me the eagle eye, it, it, you know, using RPM OS tree, maybe we could package up some things like an Apache service as a system container, and I just download it, run it on my machine. It listens at port 80. It just happens to have a different, uh, uh, different user space than the host. It uses var ww as where its content is on the host. So the way I manage it is pretty, you know, I do a system, system D uh, start, Apache and it starts up or you know, so I manage it just like I would manage an RPM installed thing But it just comes from it and as we go forward you might want to do stuff like that towards um, 
things like, you know, say you have Fedora 28 and someone gave you a, a container from Fedora 26 and you want to continue running it, you don't want to have to upgrade uh, that application was built, built on technology there. Or in the RHEL world, you might be running an application that's built on RHEL 7 on top of Apache. How do I lift and shift that to it without, I'm not buying into this open shift in Kubernetes world, all I want to do is get my application off of Fedora 26 or Fedora, I mean RHEL 6 or RHEL 7 onto a RHEL 8 box and this might be a mechanism to do it. Yeah, I'm looking around here. Mara, what systems have been running? Run upstairs right now. I think it's Fedora on the I'm done. <laughs> and I'm Dan Walsh. Um, <laughs> Tanner, your inner Dan. No. Uh, all right. I'm Dusty Mabe. I do a lot in the Fedora Atomic Working Group upstream. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Fedora Atomic Host. So one thing that we're doing now is we are delivering uh, new updates to Fedora Atomic Host every two weeks. Um, and we try to make sure that we don't break things every time we update. So. Uh, if you're following Fedora Atomic Host on your server um, that might be hosting some service that you might like, um, when you run RPM OS tree upgrade, you should be pretty comfortable uh, with the fact that we've actually run some tests on that and made sure it worked. However, you should also be pretty comfortable even if you don't think we're good at testing because the RPM OS tree uh, technology allows you to roll back and report a bug at that point and come interact with us in the Atomic Working Group, which is my next bullet point. So the Atomic Working Group kind of started off slow. We were kind of a little bit of a, a merge of the Cloud Working Group and this new Atomic thing that was kind of focused on containers and containers and cloud. People like to put those together a lot. So we were pretty much the same group for a long time. But we decided recently um, in the past six months or so to actually split it out so that we're a separate working group uh, so that it's less confusing to people who are coming to uh, meetings to talk about the cloud base image that Fedora has versus the atomic uh, offerings that we have. So we split it out into a separate working group to hopefully be a little more clear. Um, and we've also got quite a bit of involvement in the Atomic Working Group over the past six months. I think we've grown quite a bit. There's a lot of people coming from non-Red Hat um, to talk about the future of this project and to have influence on it and to say, hey, this doesn't work or hey, this does work. Uh, a lot of people using it in large infrastructures that may not be named. Uh, which is really nice. So um, the community is really growing and I'm happy about it and I encourage everybody here to come and, and participate in the conversation. We're in Pound Atomic on Freenode. Um, we've had some release engineering improvements over the past six months or so. Uh, so that's probably not as important to some of you guys, but what it means is that our lives are a little bit easier. We're more able to deliver every two weeks and actually have stuff tested. We have many, many, many great ideas on how to make that way better than it is right now. So uh, we're getting there. Um, one of the other things we changed recently was we moved from device mapper back in storage to overlay to storage by default on Fedora Atomic Host. Uh, so that gives us quite a few benefits that we like. We haven't really heard much and as far as like negative feedback about that. So we're continuing down that path for now. Um, we also, in the last release, uh, Fedora 27 Atomic Host, we're doing Kubernetes delivered with system containers. So previously we had Kubernetes in the base OS tree. But uh, that's kind of an interesting case if you want to run OpenShift on top or, you know, any other container orchestrator. So what that means is, you know, uh, we basically took Kubernetes out of the base, and if you want to run Kubernetes, you install it either via system container or some other containerized method, or you can still package layer if you want to. But this means that you can use an installer or whatever else to layer that type of support in, and the, the host can kind of focus more on just the core essentials. Next slide. So uh, I believe Colin kind of talked a little bit more about OS3 earlier, but some of the things that we've added recently that some people don't know about is the fact that we actually can install RPMs into Atomic Host. If you took a look at Atomic Host when it first came out and you discounted it because you're like, oh, I can't add software and I don't feel like containerizing everything, you might want to take a, another look at it because we added package layering, which basically means if you really, really want them, you can install it. Um, 
and overrides and replace, which basically means that if you need to install a package that requires a newer version of something that is in the base OS tree and we haven't released a new version yet, you can actually get to that if you want to. Um, and replace just means, oh, well, actually that was, yeah. You can remove stuff, you can do whatever you want to. We don't necessarily encourage you to because we like you to use the base OS that we've tested. Uh, but if necessary, the tools are there. Next slide. Uh, so this is Fedora Atomic Workstation. I asked Colin to add a few things in here. Um, I'll give you this. This. The one nice thing is that we are actually delivering updates now, which is good. Okay, uh, this one was just really a side project that apparently is getting a lot of interest. Um, and it was actually definitely one of the use cases originally. So um, way back in a number of years ago now, I was on the desktop team at Red Hat. And, uh, you know, we definitely had requests from some big customers, you know, managing whole vast fleets of Linux-based desktops. Um, although they often had, like, Windows and a VM or something like that. But... They, they really wanted atomic upgrades. You know, they really wanted, because, you know, people will just run out of battery while they're updating and all that stuff, just the really basic thing, right? They also wanted things, ideally, like being able to make updates mandatory, right? So um, just kind of force a reboot even, um, but, you know, keep up the upgrades atomic. Um, so the technology has always been agnostic. Uh, so it's actually really interesting. If you look at atomic host, it's just a list of packages. So... Fedora Atomic Workstation is just a bigger list of packages. Uh, and uh, that's, and it has, although in some cases it's a different set of packages from Workstation, we remove some things because Workstation just has some crazy stuff that should go in containers. So for example, GoScript, uh, we just remove that. And I actually want to strip more stuff like that out. So the ideal is you run more of your tools in containers. So yeah, but, but like I said, actually for Atomic Host, you don't need to jump into this right away, but what I would really recommend first is try and containerize more of your apps, right? So in especially in the desktop case, hopefully you saw the Flatpak talks. Try out Flatpak. You know, if you have some app installs in RPM, yum, remove it and try and use the Flatpak, right? Like try and get into that flow of, okay, I have a different user space for my apps. Um, so that's one of the bigger ones. And uh, yeah, if you're a developer of server apps, one of the awesome things about using Linux as a desktop, as opposed to Mac OS or Windows, is you can just run OC cluster up on your desktop and not have to deal with a whole layer of VMs. And uh, it works pretty well. There's a lot of stuff that can be improved there, but it allows, it gives you a Kubernetes OpenShift cluster locally. You know, you can build and test server apps. It's great. Uh, you'll see a lot of that in OpenShift talks. And the great thing is, again, you can just install that in your workstation. And actually, we don't have that installed by default, and I think I probably want to, but right now you RPM most tree install it. And then of course, yeah, the fact that you have atomic upgrades, I mentioned this, you know, for my desktop, like because yeah, Nuvo is unstable, just it's it's so awesome. And there Yeah, there are other talks. Um there's a whole vast swath of issues here. One of them is just the whole thing is confusing. Uh, and uh, yeah, because like I said, there's just sort of separate things going on that we're merging together, but they all go well together. And yeah, we definitely need to figure out what is the relationship of this with the current workstation and to what degree, hmm, especially to what degree we try and do containerization stuff in the workstation as it is today. Because you know, one of the biggest differences is I don't install development tools on my host file system. So GCC lives in my devel container, right? And that's a radical change for a lot of people who are using Linux as a desktop today. But I think it's really, the benefits are great. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that you sort of lose because I use Emacs and I use the MX compile command, which just like runs make, right? But makes in a totally different user space than my Emacs. So um, I haven't like wired Emacs up from my desktop to like learn how to run make in my container. A whole bunch of stuff like that. So um, yeah, that's something that's happening and this is experimental. It's not going to break, but um, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's totally broken. RPM OS tree completely breaks it. So, but we can make it work, and we can make an atomic. But like that, Let's talk about that a little bit. yeah. The, the whole I looked at that code, and it's all crazy. Like it just needs to be completely rewritten. But the, yeah, the awesome thing is we'll be able to make those upgrades atomic um, at some point. But yeah, that's actually that could be a major blocker for a lot of people. We will fix it at some point because it comes up in the server case too for GPUs. So that's it. <laughs> okay, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I can keep this really short. All that stuff, 
but in, based on CentOS. This is what CentOS Atomic Host is. So it's just regular CentOS RPMs composed into OS tree image, and then you run your apps uh, in Docker containers or, uh, yeah, or system containers. Again, all that same stuff. The first link here is a link to the CentOS wiki with a bunch of information about CentOS Atomic Host. There's the main release of it that's released every month, uh, along with CentOS has a convention of releasing new media every month. And then uh, there's a con continuous version where certain key kind of atomic components are um, updated much more frequently. And so you, that's a great uh, way to try out new stuff. And then uh, the GitHub location is where our, all our uh, definitions for the host and all the scripts for how we build everything live. Uh, you can do all sorts of things with that. And uh, Atomic and CentOS Devel on Freenode or where uh, we hang out and ping me, Jay Brooks, and uh, if you have questions. Um, one more thing before we move to pizza, as Dusty already said. Um, Everyone's welcome to contribute, and any ideas, suggestions, and stuff best start out in the IRC channel. Have fun. We have about 10 minutes left in this room, and we have pizza, and we have a lot of swag, uh, both T-shirts and stickers and pins. Um, so please take something with you. And the speakers are all here, so if you have questions, grab a slice of pizza. Part of that is the future of the 